thank you very much. And it is a privilege to be able to be with you and trust that God will give help this evening. I gather from the number of people I see joined to the meeting this evening, this, this goes beyond the assembly at Charlottetown. Wasn't quite prepared for that, but I trust God will nevertheless give help. Reading in Galatians and chapter number six, Paul's epistle to the Galatians and chapter number six. Commencing at verse number one, brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one, other, one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Let him that is taught in the word communicate to him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, but especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Now we trust that God will bless his word and give us good understanding as we consider these precious scriptures together. If this were a Bible reading, I would be dividing the chapter and telling you the first 10 verses, give us the portrait of a life controlled by the spirit. And then where we did not read verses 11 to 18, the passion of a life consecrated to the savior. So the portrait of a life controlled by the spirit and then the passion of a life consecrated to the savior. But we're going to be mainly looking at the first 10 verses and at this portrait that is given to us of what I call the, the portrait of really a spiritual man. Now, you will know that the idea of the spiritual man is found in three places in Scripture. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, at the end of that chapter and the beginning of chapter 3, Paul refers to the spiritual man. He does that again in chapter 14. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. And here in chapter 6, he which is spiritual, or ye which are spiritual. So that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 3, it is the spiritual man and the book. He recognizes that it is the breathing of God, the mind of Christ, the spiritual man and the book. In chapter number 14, it is the spiritual man and the blueprint for God's assembly. He bows to the commandments of the Lord relative to the blueprint or pattern for God's assembly. And of course, here in Galatians chapter 6, it is the spiritual man and his brethren. So we are looking now at how we deal with one another, our responsibilities one to another in assembly fellowship. Now, there are things in this chapter that would need to, if it were a Bible reading, be interpreted in light of the theme of the epistle. Paul dealing with the problem of those who are introducing law as a means of both salvation primarily and then of, of pleasing God and sanctification. And so when he speaks in chapter 6 about ye which are spiritual, he is mainly thinking of a man who fulfills what we have at the end of chapter 5, who is living his life in the power of the Spirit of God and not by law keeping. But while we would be proper to interpret strictly in light of context, you'll allow me just to take some of the principles and allow them to leap over contextual barriers and apply them in a more general way. And I hope you will not hold me accountable for poor exegesis if I should do that this evening. So the goal is to understand the passage, but also to give some practical application to all of us in light of the word of God and our current need. So I want to think, first of all, then, the, the, at this portrait of a life controlled by the spirit of God. And the first thing I see is 
A man who is spiritual will have a care for others. A care for others. If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Now the idea here may well be someone who is overtaken by the teaching of these legalists who are trying to impose law and rule keeping, going back to the Mosaic law. But again, I think we have a larger principle here. If you, are, if you see someone overtaken in a fault, we have a responsibility for the care one of another. We cannot ignore each other's spiritual needs. We cannot close our eyes to it. We are responsible for the well-being of each other. I think it is very, very insightful and also very, very telling. The Lord Jesus Christ gave two commands in the upper room. The first one, do this in remembrance of me, and we carry that out faithfully, at least when we're able to without the COVID restrictions. He gave another commandment, to love one another. That one is more difficult for us to comply with because of our personalities, because of the indwelling flesh. But I think here we are seeing, if especially when we come down to some of the verses that follow fulfilling the law of Christ, I think here we have genuine love for one another. Care for a brother who is being tripped up. I would gather from the tenses and the, the words being used, it's not a man who goes out intending to sin, but a man who is overtaken in a weak moment or perhaps in a, in a compromised situation and he is overtaken by a fault, and he ha he stumbles. Now, we're not looking at something here that the assembly must deal with, not the idea that we are covering up things that the assembly has to address, but rather the tendency for us all to, at times, have moments of weakness and failure and become discouraged and cast down. And here, the injunction is to do so, to seek to restore one another. And of course, the word of God is filled with individuals who needed restoration. Some of God's choicest servants, a David, a Peter. And we can think of others as well in the word of God who, who needed to know the touch of God in restoration. Think of, the, think of what we would have lost if John Mark had just been allowed to go his way and Barnabas had not reached out to, to restore him whatever the case may have been and whatever the cause may have been. And so we are reminded here of the tremendous value of seeking to restore. Now, we're often reminded the word there for restore is the idea of setting a bone in place, but it has another meaning as well that I think is even more apt. They would speak of, use this word for the fitting out of a vessel before it went on its voyage, making sure the vessel was fit for the seas making sure it was fit for whatever it might find. And so here, I think, is the idea of bringing this person back to a condition in which God is able to use them and they can be useful in the service of God from that moment on. So we are reminded here then, care for a brother. And of course, the energy that is involved, ye which are spiritual, restore such in one. Now, I don't think that... Paul is suggesting there is an exclusive group of believers who are spiritual and there are those who are not spiritual. God has only one standard for all his people. The only standard God has for his people is spirituality. We may not attain that, but that's God's standard for all. And those who are living in light of what we have at the end of chapter five, those who have recognized that they, they were brought to Christ in the spirit, and now they have to walk in the spirit. Now, these are those who are spiritual and recognize that it will be the spiritual fruit at the end of chapter five that will be so vital to the restoring of the man of chapter number six. The You all know it, that what we have there in chapter five, the, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, temperance, meekness. All of that is going to be necessary to be operative in the life of a spiritual man as he goes on this tremendously vital mission of seeing his brother restored. And of course, it's in the spirit of meekness, suggesting here is someone who recognizes 
his own vulnerability. Let him that thinketh he stand take heed, lest he fall. And he does it in a very lowly, in a very gracious, in a very meek way, remembering that the Lord Jesus Christ always dealt with gentleness with his own. Many years ago, when the Salvation Army was first instituted back in 1878, there was a man named Samuel Bringle who left the U.S. to go to Great Britain to join the Salvation Army and work under William Booth. When he arrived, William Booth, who must have been a very shrewd judge of character, said to him, you've been your own boss far too long. Now you're going to shine the shoes of everyone in the army. And so Samuel Bringle, a very able and very eloquent minister of the word of God, was given the task of shining shoes. One of the, on one of those occasions when he was there shining everyone's shoes, he thought to himself, imagine here I am, I've left a very successful ministry. I've come here and all I'm doing is shining shoes. And then he remembered that his Lord bent to wash the feet of disciples. And he realized that no service was really too lowly. And likewise, when we think of the restoration of our brethren, no service is too lowly. No place is too lowly for us to take. If you can bow before another and wash their feet, see them restored, you have done a, a tremendous, tremendous work for God. So number one is caring for others. Secondly, he reminds us in verse number two, carrying the burdens of others. Carrying the burdens that others bear. Bear ye one another's burdens. Now, you'll notice, of course, if you have a margin, that the word for burdens in verse 2 and the word for burdens in verse 5, that they are different words. The word that is used in verse number 2 to which we're referring carries the idea of the, the infirmities, the, the trials, the difficulties of others. And so we are here reminded that others are carrying tremendous burdens and need someone to encourage. I could spend the rest of the hour talking about the ministry of encouragement. It is a tremendously necessary ministry among the people of God. Yes, on the one hand, there needs at times to be restoration. On the other, there needs to be encouragement. There are believers who are bearing heavy burdens. Some of them are lifelong burdens that do not have an answer that is going to be found easily for them. And he reminds us here of the need to encourage. Our default position as human beings is always that of unbelief. Remember that the power of unbelief is always greater than the power of faith. Now, if you need me to test that, think of the times that after you have known a number of times where God has answered and provided, and the very next occasion where it seems like God is not answering, we default to unbelief forgetting all of the goodness and mercy of God. So our tendency is towards unbelief. And we live in a very difficult day, a day when there is opposition, when God has been marginalized, God has been trivialized, and spiritual things are totally secular, or everything has been secularized. And as a result, we, we find tremendous opposition, sailing against tremendous winds. And so there are believers who need encouragement in light of all of that. And I need to become available and I need to become sensitive that there are other believers who have problems, other believers who are carrying heavy loads, difficulties in their employment, difficulties in their health, difficulties in their marriages, difficulties with children, the whole gamut of problems that we can conceive of. There are believers who deal with that and live with that on a day-to-day -day basis and need our advice, need our counsel, need our encouragement wherever we can. And I need to ask God to make me sensitive. Not that I intrude into the lives of others. That's not what I'm speaking of. But just being sensitive. I, I am not that familiar with the assembly in Charlottetown or some of the other assemblies that have tuned in. But I think that probably in your assembly there are people who have antennas. And they seem to be able to hone in on people who need encouragement, people who needed just something to lift them and cheer them at difficult times. They seem to be so adept at it and people gravitate towards them. 
you could well become a very useful person in the assembly just by having an exercise to be an encouragement to others every time. You remember what the writer to Hebrew says, exhorting or encouraging one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So that this is a ministry that really is something that all of us could well give ourselves to. Remember again, that epistle that begins with that long treatise on encouragement. Second Corinthians chapter one. Now in our Bibles, it's translated comfort, consolation, exhortation, but the word is really encouragement. I realize it can have different shades of meaning, but I think in the context, it carries the idea of encouragement. And we are told there that God is the father of mercy and the God of all encouragement. So a believer who is an encourager of others is actually taking on the ministry of God in the assembly. God is the God of encouragement and a believer who becomes an encouragement to others is reflecting something of God's character in the assembly. Just reminds you of one instance in the Old Testament. Remember there was a, a time in David's life when he was fleeing from Saul in hiding and it tells us that Jonathan went to him in the wood. And Jonathan, the word is strengthened, but really the word is encouraged. Jonathan strengthened his hands in the Lord. Now he did it. And notice how he did it. He did it by reminding him of God's promises, of God's presence, and of God's prospect. He didn't give him empty words, cheer up, everything is going to be well. He gave him the word of God, reminded him of what God had said. And that really is how we are able to be an encouragement one to another, by bringing the word of God before each other. Now, it is a very useful thing to go through scripture and look at different times and ways in which God encouraged. So timely as with Titus coming to Paul, so, so perfectly suited to the situation, and Ones uh, Onesiphorus coming to Paul when he was in prison, off refreshing him, a breath of fresh air. So the ministry of encouragement is something I would like to stir all of us to do with, with God's help in some way. So he is a, a person who cares, and he is a person who carries the burdens of others. Romans chapter 12, that chapter that we often go to to remind ourselves of consecration and presenting our bodies, he goes from the what should mark every believer, consecration, to the variety of of gift in, in a local assembly. And he, then he comes to what should mark every believer is again. He begins that section with, let love be without dissimulation or without hypocrisy. And as he begins to unpack how that love expresses itself, he reminds me that I should be ready to distribute to need, that I should be given to hospitality, that I should weep with those that weep and mourn with those that mourn and, and rejoice with those that rejoice. So he touches there upon my hand, I should have an open hand. Touches upon my heart, I should have an open heart. He touches upon my home, I should have an open home. Whatever is needed to encourage and strengthen other believers in our service for God, I should be willing and ready to provide all of that for, for others, for others. And so here we are reminded then, a person who carries the burdens of others. And so fulfills the law of Christ or the law of love. But then here is a man as well who is conscious of his own responsibility. Here is a man, we are told, let every man prove his own work. I'm sorry, if a man think himself to, to be something when he is nothing. Now, I don't think he's saying there are some people who, are, who think they're something, but they're nothing. He's telling us that we're all nothing. Now, sorry if I hurt your self-esteem. But what he is saying is really, uh, none of us has any reason to be proud and to think that we're better than any other believer or to think that somehow we can live independent of other believers. If any man thinks himself to be something when in reality we are really nothing, nothing greater than any other believer, we're all on the same level. We stand not on merit, but on mercy. And as we think of our own responsibilities, we are reminded here that we are to bear our own responsibilities. Never think yourself superior to others and also never come looking 
Never come looking for others to bear your burden. You see, we have a false idea. We, we read scriptures such as love one another and we come and complain that no one loves us. We read scriptures such as this, that we should bear one another's burdens and we complain that no one is bearing our burden. But I am never told to look for love from others. I am never told to request others to bear my burdens. Everything is unidirectional as a Christian. I give not with the idea of getting. Now, I know it's a very high standard, but this is God's standard. This is how God gives. This is how God comforts. This is how God encourages. And so the responsibility is upon each of us to bear our own burdens. It's interesting the word he uses here could almost be equivalent to a, a backpack, a shoulder pack. So it's something that I'm able to bear. God will not give me more than I can bear. And so we are called upon to bear our own burdens rather than feel as though others have to somehow come and bear our burdens. We are here reminded that I can never have a spirit of either independence, I'm too big and don't need anyone, a feeling of insignificance, I'm nobody and nobody really cares, and likewise a spirit of insignificance, spirit of independence, a spirit also of being indispensable. That's another danger we all have. I would take it here, and again, I know I'm going beyond the, the literal meaning, the danger of unwise comparisons with others in God's assembly, either in terms of my lack of ability, like Elijah, I'm no better than my father's, or thinking that somehow I'm superior to others, unwise comparisons lead to unhealthy conclusions. And so here we are reminded to be very, very aware, have a right assessment of myself, and to be able to bear my own responsibilities, whether it's in God's assembly or in the general routine of life. Verse number six, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Strictly speaking, I think what is in view here in the context is the encouragement of those who are teaching law. If you're going to uh, sow to the flesh, you're going to reap from them. And so we're reminded here, let him that is taught in the word, if someone is teaching you what is right, then you should encourage them in fellowship and whatever other form. And I know that the assembly in Charlottetown is very active in its outreach and in its ministry to those that serve the Lord. But could I just broaden the principle here for just a moment? And could we think for a moment of supporting what is right and seeking to encourage what is right and being a help to others for it with what is right? Because we are reminded here of this principle of sowing and reaping. And in light of that, he then brings them to the need to continue in well-doing. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for we shall, in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So I want to encourage us all with not just caring for others, not just carrying the burden of others, not just being conscious of my own responsibility, not just communicating with those who are helping and teaching what is right, but as well with continuance in well-doing. Again, in the context, there likely is a very limited, specific application, interpretation to those who are seeking to carry out the truth of God as taught by Paul and communicated to them in this epistle. But I think we can broaden again the, the concept. In fact, in, chapter, in the second epistle, he's going to remind them of the danger that their well-doing was being taken advantage of by those who were not working. And actually, they, they were to put an end to their well-doing relative to the, the loafers, those who were refusing to work. But here he's telling us of this great principle that to do good unto all men, especially those who are the household of faith, and not to lose heart. So we have an obligation, first of all, that is brought before us here. I have an obligation to persistently pursue well-doing without becoming weary. Now, again, that may link itself with where we began 
with caring for others and carrying others' burdens, but the well-doing is a general statement. Is what I am currently doing, is my contribution to the local assembly, is my contribution to the community, is it marked by doing well? And am I willing to continue at it? We very sadly have bought into a mentality which controls the business world. And that is if it doesn't work, change it. Now, I am all in favor of examining our methods and making sure that we are doing them according to the word of God and the will of God. But just because a particular method is not bearing fruit immediately does not mean we desist, does not mean we throw up our hands in a sense of frustration and defeat. We never need feel defeated. We learn from 2 Timothy chapter 3 in those verses that deal with the inspiration of scripture, that all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be truly furnished unto every good work. The word of God will equip us for everything God wants us to do. Every work God intends you to carry out, he will equip you through his word. There is no deficiency in the word of God. The methods are here. We need the wisdom and the grace to continue in well-doing because in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So an obligation is seen in this verse and then an outcome that is promised. We will eventually reap. May not be now. In fact, for many believers, it may not be actually in your lifetime. I am sure there are Maybe surprises is a very poor word to use, but you'll allow me to use it for want of a better word. I think there are going to be a lot of surprises in heaven when believers who have prayed all their lives for family, friends to be saved, did not see them saved until they themselves were taken home to heaven. And after they have gone, prayers are answered and they'll meet in heaven. In due season, reaping, if we do not faint. So we are reminded here of the outcome that God has promised. And we are reminded then of being sensitive and being and looking for opportunities. As we therefore have opportunity, looking for opportunities to do well to others. Doesn't mean doesn't matter really if we are recognized ourselves, doesn't matter if we get the credit. Let me just take a moment. I know I'm going over the time I intended, but just take a moment and relate to you an account. There was a young girl named Annie who was born in 1868. At 10 years of age, she was sent to a poor house for children. This was, this was in Massachusetts here in the States. Her mother had died. Her father had deserted her. An aunt and uncle could not live with her because she was so given the temper tantrums and rebellion and generalized nastiness that she owned to a fine skill. And so they sent her to a poor house. While there, another girl by the name of Maggie, who also was in the poor house, befriended her. And it was a very difficult, difficult time. She would throw things at her. She would throw her food at her. She would curse at her. She did everything she could to somehow vent her frustration. You see, Annie had a very bad eye condition that made her almost blind. And Maggie took that girl in, in her hands and slowly over a number of years made a new person out of her. Maggie was a believer, a Christian. And she said, because of the love of Christ, I will do everything I can to help this young woman. Annie's, Annie's last name was Annie Sullivan. Annie Sullivan eventually was able to regain eyesight through some medical and surgical procedures done. And she heard of a school for blind children and she was sent there. She learned very well. And when she graduated from Perkins School for the Blind, having regained some of her sight, she wanted to help someone else who was blind. And they sent her to Alabama to help a, a young girl by the name of Helen. Seven-year-old girl who was not only blind but deaf. 
that little girl by the name of Helen was Helen Keller. Now, maybe some of you know about Annie Sullivan, her teacher, but I doubt any of you know about the Christian by the name of Maggie, who, because she persisted in well-doing, brought about a tremendous change for everyone who has ever been born blind since then. Now, persistence in well-doing takes tremendous faith and confidence in God. But this is the portrait of a man whose life is controlled by the Spirit of God, a man whose life is yielded for God to use. He will be sensitive to the needs of others. He will be persistent in his seeking to do well. In fact, this chapter itself, if we were to look at it in its entirety, it shows us the tremendous portrait of this individual who was seeking with passion for Christ to be a blessing to others. So I trust that some of what we have said will find an echo in some heart this evening and be a help as we consider the tremendous responsibility we have as believer, as believers to fulfill the law of Christ, to reflect something of the character of God, to have a care one for another and to seek with God's help to be a blessing wherever God has placed us in the assembly, in our homes, in our communities, that we will, as we are reminded here in the very last verse, to seek opportunity as opportunity arises, let us do good unto all men. So I would I think that is embraceive. Unsaved neighbors, unsaved friends, wherever it may be, all men, but especially, as he reminds us here, to the household of faith. So I, got, I trust God will bless his word and encourage us all for his namesake. Shall we just take a moment and speak to God together in prayer?